Good afternoon. We are starting the session with shoulder examination. First of all, examination of the shoulder usually starts after proper history taking. So you have to be guided by the history of the patient himself. You have to consider the age of the patient and the complaint. So you have to direct yourself towards the most probable diagnosis. You have to think about the age of the patient. What's the complaint? Is it an instability problem? Is the rotator cuff pathology? Is the biceps problem, etc. So your diagnosis, you have to put the history and the examination together to reach the diagnosis. As in all orthopedic examination, the basic algorithm is look, feel, move, and then you perform the special tests needed, guided by the pathology you're looking for. You have to remember, always start by cervical spine examination, especially in patients complaining of shoulder pain, especially that most, most of the problems with cervical spine, especially radiating to C5, may mimic problems in the shoulder. Always expose both shoulders and examine both shoulders compared to the contralateral side and as always with examination practice makes perfect. Starting with inspection, following the abbreviation DCS, first start with looking for any deformity. Look at both shoulders, look for any asymmetry, check the shoulder height and any scapular winging. Look for the contour of the muscles. Is there any muscle wasting? As example here, as deltoid wasting, is there any atrophy of the supraspinatus or infraspinatus muscles in chronic calf tears? And check the skin for any scars for previous operation as arthroscopy or other operation for hip reduction internal fixation of the shoulder, for example. Then you start by palpating the shoulder. Starting with the bony prominences you have, it's very important here to have a direction regarding either you start from medial to lateral or from lateral to medial. It's, um, it's beneficial to have a direction so you don't miss any point. You can start medially by palpating the sternoclavicular joint, the clavicle, the acromioclavicular joint, the acromion, the coracoid process, and the umbral head. Also from the front, you can palpate the bicepital groove. The bicepital groove, you can reach the bicepital groove in neutral rotations, one centimeter lateral to the coracoid process. Also from the back, you can palpate the scapular spine, the scapular borders, infraspinates and supraspinatus muscles. Range of motion, active before passive range of motion, and you should always compare both sides when testing for the range of motion because not all individuals have the same range of motion. There are three cardinal planes of motion that should be examined and documented. Forward elevation in the scapular plane, external rotation both at the side and 90 degrees of abduction, and internal rotation to the vertebral height and also in 90 degrees of abduction. Forward elevation can be recorded in either the supine position or standing. It should be done against the wall to prevent hyperextension of the back. Here the arc of motion is recorded and the arc that the elbow makes in the sagittal plane. External rotation can be measured in abduction as you see in the picture here, here the examiner cradles the elbow with slight abduction away from the torso as to relax the superior glenumeral ligament and the coracoumeral ligament and above the bed, slightly above the bed to eliminate any shoulder extension and then the external rotation degree can be measured. It also can be done in degree uh, measured in 90 degrees of abduction as shown here. Internal rotation can be done in abduction and it's measured to the nearest vertebral level. The non-measured 
or the contralateral scapula is used as a reference. As a superior border, the scapula is at T4, the inferior border is at T7, and the iliac crest is at L4. So this acts as a guide to detect the level of the internal rotation range. Also, internal rotation, as before, can be repeated in the supine position as to detect the internal rotation range with the shoulder abducted to 90 degrees. A glenoid in a glenoid internal rotation deficit is defined as a deficit more than 25 degrees when compared to the contralateral shoulder. What about pseudoparalysis? Pseudoparalysis is defined as it has many, it has more than one definition. One definition is that it considers one plane of movement, which is less than 90 degrees of active anterior elevation with a maintained passive elevation. Another definition combines two movements. It's combined loss of active elevation and external rotation. Then we proceed to special tests, starting with anterior, uh, with instability testing. We will start with anterior instability. The most commonly performed test is the apprehension, relocation, and the release test. Starting the apprehension test, as done as illustrated here, it can be done either in the sitting or the supine position. The position of the shoulder is in 90 degrees of abduction and 90 degrees of elbow flexion with increasing gradual increasing the range of external rotation with an anterior directed force to the posterior humerus. The positive test here is the sense of apprehension the patient feels as his shoulder is going to dislocate. In the setting position, you can follow the apprehension test with the relocation test where a posteriorly or a downward pressure on the proximal humerus relieves the sense of apprehension of the patient. While releasing that pressure repeats the sense of apprehension. Sensitivity markedly increases with apprehension, not pain, as a result of the test. Another test is the anterior load and shift test, where a compressive force is applied by one hand of the examiner to center the glenoid on to center the humerus on the glenoid fossa, while the other arm produces a translatory force either anteriorly or posteriorly to take translation of the humeral head, where we have grades either to translation to the rim, translation over the rim, or subluxation over um, so, subluxation of the umbrella head. The test performed here is the Gaggy hyperabduction test, which tests the inferior glenohumeral laxity. It's important to stabilize the scapula and passively abduct the shoulder. Abduction more passive, abduction more than 105 degrees indicates inferior glenohumeral laxity. Posterior instability as we discussed before the anterior load and shift test here the posterior load and shift test is performed where instead of doing an anterior translation of the humeral head we have to try posterior translation of the humeral head and detect the distance or uh, the amount of translation over the posterior rim also we have here the posterior apprehension test the examiner stands behind the patient where a posterior directed force is applied to the elbow and the shoulder is in 90 degrees of abduction and with the elbow flexed and in full internal and the shoulder in full internal rotation. The other hand, feel, the examiner feels the subluxation of the umbral head and a positive test is a palpable subluxation or a dislocation, apprehension of a bending dislocation or pain that reproduces the patient's symptoms. Another test is the jerk test, where in the sitting position or in the supine position, a posterior or an axial load is applied to the elbow with adduction of the shoulder, shoulder, and then moving from a position of adduction to abduction, usually a clunk or the jerking of uh, the shoulder is 
felt as the humeral head uh, is uh, relocated after being subluxated. Testing for multidirectional instability. Testing for in the patient setting or uh, setting position. A downward pulling forces applied to the elbow in the neutral rotation position at first, and we see the distance that the humeral head translates below the acromion. The test is repeated in maximal external rotation, and if the sulcus sign persists in maximum external rotation, this indicates rotator internal incompetence. As part of the generalized legacy assessment, we have to calculate the Byton score. We have to look for passive hyperextension of the small finger, passive movement of the thumb to reach the forearm, elbow hyperextension more than 10 degrees, knee recurvatum or hyperextension more than 10 degrees, and position of both palms flat on the floor with the knee locked in extension. Here, how do how we identify that? A score greater than four in a skeletally mature adult is means that he has generalized hypermobility. What about the rotator cuff muscle testing? When we deal with the rotator cuff muscles, we'll talk about two things. We have to talk about each muscle has a strength test and has a leg sign. Starting with the supraspinatus, we start with the Jobs test or an empty can test with the shoulder abducted to 90 degrees with the thumb pointing to the floor. This is the position where the supraspinatus, uh, the muscle tendon unit, is parallel to the floor. The leg sign is the drop arm sign where the examiner puts the shoulder in a position of abduction and asks the patient us to slowly move the patient to add slowly abduct the shoulder failure of the patient to do that with the dropping of the arm is a positive leg sign. The empty can test can be done as a full can test with the thumb pointing upwards. It, the test can also isolate the supraspinatus and it's less painful in patients with impingement. Infraspinatus strength testing is done at this external rotation of both uh, of the shoulders and it can be done simultaneously bilateral to as to compare to the other side while the external rotation leg side or as sometimes you can read it is the dropping sign the shoulder is brought into maximum passive external rotation and the patient is asked to hold the position a positive test is the failure of the patient the patient cannot hold the position of the maximum external rotation subscapular stress testing the most important test to know here is the left of test the patient is asked to push his hand or uh, push his hand away from the back. Uh, however, it can't be done in patients with internal rotation contracture. We have two other tests, which is the belly press test. A positive test here, the patient, the patient is asked to lock his wrist and uh, press against his belly. A positive test is wrist. The patient cannot internally rotate, so he, he flexes the wrist. Another example is the bear hug test, which can be done as you're in 90 degrees of abduction. The patient is asked to push against his contralateral shoulder, and you can feel the pressure applied by the hand. And the positive test is with pain or inability to push down. The lag sign of the subscapularis here can be done after the left off test where the hand of the patient is passively moved away from the shoulder, from his back, and the patient is asked to maintain this position. Failure to do that is a positive sign. In the subscapularis and large tears, the patient usually has increased passive external rotation rate. Teres minor can be tested with external rotation in 90 degrees of shoulder abduction. And the leg test here is the horn blower sign. The arm is brought in 90 degrees of abduction and 90 degrees of external rotation. The patient is asked to maintain this position. Failure to do so is a positive horn blower sign. 
superior labrum injuries, superior labrum anterior and posterior lesions can be tested using the active compression test or the O'Brien test, which is similar to the job test, but it's done in 15 degrees of adduction. Here, the positive test is a feeling of deep pain inside the joint, not superficial pain localized at the acromioclavicular joint, as we'll discuss later. Another test is the crank test, which is similar to McMurray's test for the knee, where an axial load is applied and then applying external and internal rotation, reproducing the pain. And we have two other tests, which is a biceps load test, which is number one, which is done in patients with associated anterior instability. The arm is brought into the apprehension position. A positive test is done when the elbow flexion against resistance does not relieve the pain where the pain increases. Another test is the biceps load test too, which is done in patients not having history of anterior instability. Here we have an abduction of 120 degrees and maximum external rotation and elbow flexion against resistance produces pain inside the joint. Biceps tendon injuries can be examined for by the biceptal groove tenderness. Speed test as shown in as illustrated here is positive with elbow uh, extend, extended and the shoulder elevation against resistance. Positive as the pain is in the biceptal groove. Another test is the Jerkson sign where there is biceptal groove pain with resisted supination of the forearm with the elbow in flexion, uh, 90 degrees flexion position. Ruptures of the biceps tendon can be associated with a pop eye sign. Impingement testing can be start with near impingement tests, where the examiner stabilizes the scapula and the shoulder is brought into position of abduction with internal rotation of the shoulder to uh, reproduce pain in the anterolateral shoulder. The speed can be the test can be repeated after injection of 1% lidocaine. Relief of pain associated with apology confirms the position, uh, the presence of impingement. Another test is the Hawkins test. Shoulder is brought into 90 degrees of abduction with passively, maximally internally rotating the shoulder and the pain is reproduced at the end of the lateral shoulder. Acromioclavicular joint pathology, we have AC joint terminus, it's sensitive but it's not specific. Cross arm adduction test, reproducing pain in the AC joint, and the active compression test, which is similar to the O'Brien's test, but here the pain is superficial. It's not deep inside the shoulder joint, it's localized to the acromioclavicular joint. At the end, Please do not forget neurovascular examination, especially examining the axillary nerve, especially in patients with history of previous surgeries. Thank you.